Hello everybody. Welcome back to Natural and Artificial Environment. This is your professor, Gunnar Futh, and today we're going to continue on in our first unit, looking at some of the fundamental ideas and concepts and issues associated with the environments that surround us, how they impact us, and how we might think about some of these fundamental questions. So I'm going to start with a recap and then we're going to be reading one article today, a longer article, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. So just to summarize kind of what we've been doing so far, we've looked at the definitions of an environment. We've looked at the distinction between natural and artificial. So we defined an environment as that which surrounds and influences human life. Things like nature out there, outside of the houses and the apartments that we live in, the forests, the trees, rock and stone, water, the air, the atmosphere. Things that we might characterize as ecosystems, including other life, bacterial, fungal, animal, and so on. We might also call the environment the geography in which we live, but also everything that humans have constructed and influenced. Things like culture and society, law, politics, ideology, economics, the very buildings that we live in, and other mental and cognitive artifacts, such as the ideas, the concepts, the religions, and the worldviews that we traffic in. Arguably, all of these things could be considered a part of the environments that we live and move through. Now, what I tried to impress upon you last time, uh, over the last two weeks, rather, is that these things don't have a static relationship to one another. Humans and our environments influence each other. As the environment influences us, our minds, our speech, our actions change, and through those things, we impact the environment as well. So these things kind of have a retroactive causal relationship. Nature influences the development of society and culture and culture and society and all that stuff in turn influences nature. Now, what we looked at last time was this distinction between natural and artificial and more particularly the definitions and concepts of nature that humans have come up with throughout the last few thousand years. We looked at ancient Greek conceptions of nature, ancient Roman conceptions of nature, how nature has, our concept of nature has evolved throughout the saturation of Christianity into Western society, and also contemporary ideas about nature. What made this exploration difficult is that we have a lot, a lot of ideas and concepts and definitions as to what nature is. So depending on which of those we're going to invoke, which one of those we're going to follow, that's going to influence how we look at these questions. It's going to influence how and why we characterize certain things as natural and artificial. And it's also going to influence how we conceive of that retroactive causal relationship that we have to the environments that we occupy and move within. So that is just a brief summary of what we've been looking at so far. What we're doing this week is we're looking at a piece written by sociologist Douglas Massey in which he provides kind of a history and an analysis of the development of human societies, including all of the things that we've already mentioned, economics, religion, culture, but he's primarily doing it through the lens of evolutionary biology. So this week is going to have a distinct biological component to it. And one of the things that Massey is going to try to convince us of is if we want to have a clearer understanding of human society and human action, we need to develop some sort of understanding of our biological and evolutionary origins. So, that's what we're going to be investigating. At the beginning of the article, 
he argues that three conceits, as he calls them, obfuscate understanding of human social development. That is, he's kind of calling out some of the fundamental fields, including sociology, for lacking an understanding of human biology and its evolutionary origins, how our modernized understanding of humanity and what it accomplishes has kind of come to oversaturate or over encompass our understanding of what's going on socially. And that there's also this prioritization of rationality in our understanding of human nature and how and why human societies develop. But these are all overgeneralizations, oversimplifications. They involve overemphasizing various lenses and concepts of human nature and human social development. So through his analysis of human society, he's going to be, well, trying to argue against these conceits and show how they are lacking and how they're holding back our own understanding of our origins, development, and our future. So his goal in this piece is to explain and support these critiques of these conceits by looking at the development of human biology, society, and their interplay, and seeing what these things might imply about the current state of humanity and human society and the future of human development. So the majority of this piece is going to be caught up in kind of an evolutionary bio biological analysis of humanity, but we're going to kind of look at that through the lens of human social development. So we're not really going to get into the thick of those biological and adaptive mechanisms that humans have obtained through natural selection. We're going to be talking about some biological characteristics that have changed over time, but primarily we're looking at the evolution of human society. So this investigation is going to be split up into two parts. In the first part, we're going to look at human social development in distinct eras of human society. And then in the next lecture, we're going to look at the current era of human social development that we are in, some of Massey's concluding thoughts on this analysis and our contemporary social situation, and how we might use our more complete understanding to tackle some of the problems that we are facing now and that will face us socially in the future. Okay, let's begin. So the majority of this essay is basically Massey providing an analysis of the development of human societies. He notes that according to his view, there are basically seven eras of human social development wherein humans and their biological ancestors went through different stages of evolution, developed different cognitive mechanisms and physiological mechanisms, and consequently, through humans' interconnectedness with nature and the unique geographical problems that they were faced with, human societies developed in different ways, developed different tools, and slowly over time developed more complex forms of culture and social relationship. The first era that he looks at is pre habeline society, which he thinks, according to our best guesses, our best scientific research, emerged around 6 million years ago. This era of human society was characterized by primarily two species of human ancestors, Ardipithecus, sorry, Ardipithecus ramidus, and later Australopithecus africanus. How these species ended up descending from the trees, from our primate ancestors and started living on the ground. According to what the best scientific evidence that we have, 
what went along with this descent from the trees to living on the grounds and the savannas and the plains were these ancestors evolving to walk upright, which would eventually give them various sensory and cognitive mechanisms that we that they could view the world through a more uh, in a more competitive way and allow them to better understand their surroundings and move within it. During this time, we also see a lot of evidence of human sexual dimorphism, which is basically this idea that there were some stark differences between the sexes in these human ancestors. Human males had certain characteristics and human females had certain characteristics and they varied. Generally, human males were taller, had more musculature, had larger bodies and different genitalia, obviously. And females too were generally smaller, had less defined and dense musculature and had different genitalia and reproductive organs as well. So there was, compared to today, a larger biological difference between males and females. Well, how did these human ancestors live? Primarily, they survived through foraging, scavenging, and hunting of small prey, and they were generally geographically confined to the continent of Africa. So at this point in our human history, these life forms had not spread out across the globe yet. They were basically confined to Africa. Massey notes that these human ancestors had high social intelligence. Odds are that they were able to maintain social cohesion and social relationships through grooming, just like uh, how primates do it. But at this point, they were lacking in rationality, the ability to engage in abstract reasoning and conceptualization. And they also lacked the kinds of tools that we had today. And we might argue primitive tools that would make their lives easier. Well, as you know, society and biology does not remain static. If you buy into the theory of evolution, or even just evolution generally, you know that organisms adapt to their environment. And consequently, that human society and culture is going to evolve as well. And that's what happened. The next era of the development of human society that Massey discusses is the Oldowan society, which he argues, according to our best scientific evidence, emerged around 2.5 million years ago. Now, a brief note before we get into this. What Massey is doing here is he's providing a summary of the scientific evidence and knowledge as he understands it about human origins and human social development. What in turn I have done is provided a summary or a synthesis of the analysis that he provides in this article, A Brief History of Human Societies. So as we're going through this, keep in the back of your mind that what Massey has provided is something of an oversimplification of all of these complex biological and social changes. And in turn, then, what I am providing is an even uh, more drastic oversimplification of these views. So, if you want to have a better understanding of human evolutionary and social development, you should really take something like an evolutionary biology class. There you'll get more into the thick of it. Insofar as this is a philosophy class, we're going to gloss over a lot of the in the weeds scientific evidence for this stuff. So just keep that in the back of your mind. As we noted earlier, the society was then transitioned into what we might characterize as the old Darwin society. This also corresponded with a change in evolution. No longer were there these species of human ancestors running around, the 
Ardepithecus ramidus and Australopithecus africanus, but they, those species, would evolve eventually into Homo habilis, which in turn, due to their evolutionary changes and their social changes, would come to rely more strongly on hunting over gathering and foraging. Also, Homo habilis is associated with larger skeletons and body weight. So after our ancestors' descent from the trees and after they were hanging out on the ground for a long time, we kind of got bigger and we kind of got stronger. We would be able to stand more upright, see more of the landscape, which in turn would help us hunt better and engage in prey detection and prey aversion. During this era of human society, Massey also notes that social bonds were formed and the upkeep of those social bonds occurred through grooming and the sizes of groups that humans lived in got larger. Also during this long time, uh, this species developed larger brain size and due to this larger brain size and evolution in those cognitive mechanisms, physiological mechanisms, they would come to develop stone tools, which would make their lives a lot easier, which would make their hunting and cutting up of animals and the use of those resources easier. This would also allow for more population growth because insofar as all those activities and the activities that we engage in for the necessity of biological life became easier, that would allow more people to be born, more people to be fed, more people to contribute. And so you have kind of like a feedback loop, right? However, but at this time in human history, there was little cognitive or cultural change. The ancestors of Homo sapiens, Homo habilis, habilis, had not yet developed the kind of tools or concepts or the ability to think like we have today. So, while there was a steady, slow evolutionary change, at this point in human history, our best guess is that they didn't have the same kind of conceptual tools and conceptual mechanisms that we have. Enter Paleolithic society, which we think emerged about one and a half million years ago. From Homo habilis, Homo erectus would evolve, which obviously is a reference to the upright standing uh, human ancestor, right? One of their defining characteristics. During this time, height became more uniform among humans. I think Massey says that over this time period, human height on average would increase because females uh, would not be as short compared to males. Thus, height became more uniform and there was a slow decrease in sexual dimorphism. So there weren't such these stark differences between males and females anymore. Humans became more uniform. As these biological life forms engaged more in hunting than gathering, we think, they developed smaller teeth and guts, things that would help them digest and process those nutrients better due to their change in diet and their change in lifestyle. And they, uh, we also see a, an increase in brain and skull size, which will allow in the future for the descendants of these life forms to, well, get smarter and develop more complex, useful cognitive machinery. We think also during this time, there was the emergence of intentional use of fire for things like cooking, heating up the camp, processing resources, the building of tools, etc. We also think that those during this time uh, engaged in more of a nomadic lifestyle. Since there was a turn more towards hunting, it would become necessary for these life forms to follow the animals where they led. 
So there weren't so many permanent settlements, or at least permanent settlements did not take up they were not as frequent and not as long standing as they were before. And we see the emergence of seasonal camps as a result. As animals migrate, as the weather changes, due to this increase in the nomadic lifestyle, there would be semi-permanent gatherings of humans, but during the seasons and during the migrations of animals, these life forms would move to follow them so that they could live and survive and keep up their way of life. Over this million years, obviously there would be an advance in tools, in tool use. So we see more technological advancement. Tools would become more complex, uh, perhaps easier to use, more efficient in their purposes and design. And we also think during this time that there was the emergence of pair bonding. So while the ancestors of Homo erectus may have engaged in more fluid relationships, more fluid mating strategies, during this time we think that humans started to, males and females started to pair up more and form uh, more cohesive permanent family units. We also think that there were certain changes in female reproductive biology that went along with this. I think Massey mentions that uh, breast size increased and what this would signal biologically to males is it would provide them something like an evolutionary incentive in order to stay with the female that they mated with and help rear the child and raise the young. Obviously because this is necessary right? We know that when Homo sapien babies are born nowadays, and it was probably the case during this time as well, they need a lot of upkeep and a lot of care. Resources need to be gathered so that the family can stay alive and so that the children and the babies can be fed. Well, pair bonding would be evolutionary advantageous for this process, and the change in female reproductive biology would give the male incentive to stick around and help care for the kid rather than moving on and just mating with somebody else willy-nilly. Thus, we think we also see the dissolution of rigid dominance hierarchies. So less emphasis and a decrease in frequency of rigid, static, top-down social governance and rule among these smaller communities and family units. Massey argues that based on the evidence, culture perhaps developed in its rudimentary forms, but it was based on mimesis, which means imitation. As children and babies grow up and continue to interact with their parents and others in these communities, they would come to understand the ways of these communities and how to live and survive by observing those practices and then imitating them. This would allow for an expansion in these life forms knowledge of the world around them in the concretization of social ritual and custom. But at this point, we don't think that these life forms had language like we do today. They probably communicated through various grunts and moans and other vocalizations that were useful enough for survival, but not very useful in being a vehicle for abstract concepts or views of the world. Thus, we also see during this time that there is a spreading out more of these human ancestors into other parts of the world. No longer were they confined just to the continent of Africa, but they would also spread into various parts of Southern Asia and Southern Europe. So as these life forms migrated, as they followed animals and mated and had families, they kind of spread out a little bit. We could also make a distinction between Paleolithic society and what we might call later Paleolithic society. This is not so much an era that 
Massey discusses explicitly in its own section, but I think it's useful for our purposes here and our understanding of human evolutionary and social development. Emerging about 300,000 years ago, we think, later Paleolithic society was still, uh, well, before this, it was still dominated by Homo erectus. But as Homo erectus would come to adapt to its environment and develop different evolutionary adaptations through natural selection, that species would eventually disappear, or you could say it would transform, it would evolve into what we call the Neanderthals, Homo neanderthalensis. So we see the emergence of this species of human ancestor. The Neanderthals generally had a bulkier build. Uh, they were more muscular, uh, thicker, larger skeleton, perhaps more denser skeleton, including an increased skull size. Obviously, this would allow room for brain size to increase and for intelligence to increase. And we also think that there was an increase in group size during this time as well. So humans began to form larger communities and societies together. Culture would continue to develop during this time. It would become more complex and primarily those cultural rituals and customs and ways of life would help maintain social cohesion among those in these communities. During this time, we also see the emergence of what Massey calls composite tools, tools made up of three or more things, and the construction of more permanent shelters. So it seems to have been the case that the Neanderthals had developed a certain level of mastery over their environment such that they could reliably enough cultivate resources and stay in places longer and more permanently. So we see the development of more permanent shelters. There were still nomadic tribes during this time, but some were beginning to settle down in various geographical regions in Asia, Europe, and Africa. But not just in this, those southern places. Some also began to expand north into northern Europe. And we also think during this time we see a social change. Small bands of possibly interrelated people uh, transitioning into clans based on kinship and familiarity. This would also provide a different level, perhaps a higher level of social cohesion and primitive trust among the inhabitants of these communities, which would allow them to survive and outlast their predators and whatever else was around during this time. The next era of human development we have is what's called Neolithic society, which we think emerged around 150,000 years ago. 150,000 BC. This era is heralded by the emergence of Homo sapiens. Sapiens coming from the Greek meaning uh, or Latin meaning wise. Obviously during this time there would be a lot of evolutionary and intellectual and social changes. We think that Homo sapiens uh, evolved in Africa but slowly over time, they would slowly migrate and settle all around the globe, including Northern Europe, including Northern Asia, Southern Africa, into the Americas at one point, and then later some of the uh, islands like the Polynesian islands. What Massey thinks this suggests is Homo sapiens experienced something of a leap in technology because they would have to have some sort of tools or some sort of understanding in order to make these trips and survive them and settle in all these various different regions of the globe. According to scientific evidence, we think during this era, the human brain reached its present size, which resulted in the cultivation of a kind of intelligence that would allow for 
repeated cultural innovation ad infinitum, which basically means on into infinity. What's implied here is that Homo sapiens became intelligent enough such that they could modify their cultural forms and the content of their rituals and their customs, and they had enough intelligence to continue innovating and continue evolving in these social and cultural ways. They were no longer capped so strongly by their level of intelligence when it came to cultural development. Thus, during this time, due to, again, culture becoming more complex, uh, evidence of this technological leap due to migration into all these places, what we found is that there was the creation of various forms of tools that were made of bone, wood, fibers from various plant and animal resources, tools from animal products, weapons, clothing, permanent shelters, again, but more complex, and we might say more stable permanent shelters. And then eventually at the end of this period, the emergence of bronze tools, which would really come to influence the development of human society and technology. With each stage in human intellectual and technological development, that allows even more innovation and more social change and more potentiality for intellectual evolution as well, because now humans can do all these new things with these different tools and unlock new modes of being in the world and seeing the world. Thus, we think during this time, Homo sapiens developed new cognitive, analytical, and linguistic capacities that would allow them to hear sounds, what Massey call, calls, I think, audition. It would allow them to more hear, clearly hear and differ, differentiate between various sounds, those in nature, but more particularly those in human communities. It would allow them to conceptualize sounds attach some sort of meaning to these utterances, resulting in language, primitive forms of language, and verbal memory. Homo sapiens could now communicate with each other linguistically in a form that we do today, although perhaps a little bit more primitively, and they could engage in speech. This would be an incredible change for Homo sapiens. Because if you're able to talk to those around you, you're able to keep up your social relationships, you're able to plan for the future, you're able to communicate more efficiently your observations about the natural and social world to others, you're able in some sense to symbolize things through language. And this would open up a lot of doors for humanity. Basically, these linguistic and conceptual and analytic mechanisms would allow us to produce conceptual models of our world, refine those conceptual models, and stories and narratives about what is going on around us, including the origins of humanity, how the earth came into being, what the relationships are between humans and the natural environment, how we are supposed to live our lives, all of these different things. So we see during this time the emergence of what Massey calls mythic culture, which includes a kind of conceptual, complex conceptual understanding of the origins, natures, and relationships of all the phenomena that we see around us. And that's exactly what we see, right? Stories of how humans came into existence, why that happened, how we are supposed to interface with nature, and on the flip side, how we can better live and survive in these environments. So the emergence of language and the emergence of all these new conceptual and ling linguistic capacities really opened the door for 
increased social and cultural and religious development. Getting more now closer to the present day, we have the emergence of agrarian society. We think that these societies emerged about 10 to 12,000 years ago. And it was during this time that humans began to settle down into villages and to farm and cultivate the land, which would be a huge shift in how humans would interact with nature. Being able to farm, uh, to harvest, to rear and domesticate animals would be a huge plus for humanity. This would give them some sort of mastery over their natural environment, provide them some sort of psychological security, but also biological security, right? Because they'd be able to grow their own food. They'd be able to use animals for various purposes, whether that would be keeping them as pets, using them for hunting, using them for plowing fields and stuff like that. So what we see during this time is a food surplus, something that we don't think had ever occurred until up until this point in human history. There was a, a surplus of food, which would then allow people to, well, it would allow for more explosive population growth. And then what do you have when you have more people? You have more people holding things together, uh, maintaining the villages and the societies, engaging more in exploration, engaging more in developing an understanding of the world. Having more hands on deck, it seems, has always historically allowed us to evolve socially and intellectually more quickly. So this food plus would cause a huge population growth. And for the first time, we think in human history, it would allow for the emergence of an upper class of individuals who did not have to worry about cultivating food themselves or really any of the biological worries that humans had to worry about individually and socially for a long time. They might have servants or they might have people growing food for them, feeding them, taking care of their families and that kind of stuff. So for a small percentage of Homo sapiens, there was a very kind of relaxed and leisurely way of life that they could engage in. Up until this point, humans were always fighting for survival, fighting to maintain the strength and livelihood of their own bodies and their own families, looking for food. But this increase in food and this increase in wealth, you could say, it's an increase in wealth, would allow people for the first time a more relaxed and secure way of life. Thus, during this time, what we see is humans domesticating plants and animals for their own use and for their own resource cultivation. This would allow eventually for the emergence of cities and city-states, and these cities would expand their populations would increase, rules and laws would be developed, and this would occur through the consolidation of various peoples that were spread out living in their own settlements. Humans, you would think, would come to realize that there comes a certain security and ease of living in a walled or defended city and way of life in a lot of these rural areas would be difficult if you didn't have others also looking out for you or cooperating together for the formation of culture and resource production. I think Massey mentions that uh, in Egypt, one of the pharaohs there ended up producing one of the first and largest cities of over 100,000 people. Uh, due to the fact that there are various biological and social benefits of living in such a way. During this time, we also see the emergence of iron tools, better technologies and weapons. And for the first time in history, we think professional soldiers and standing armies. So these various cities 
would have people waiting in the wings to defend the city or invade and conquer other peoples. Obviously, through this process, there would be some cities and some communities that would see a huge increase in wealth, in land, new opportunities to cultivate resources from the spoils that they would get in war and combat, but also through, you know, other forms of expansion in imperialism. And there's also something else very interesting that happened during this time as well. As humans began to congregate in these cities, obviously germs, disease, viruses, and parasites would become endemic. When you have uh, people living in such close quarters, disease spreads very quickly. A lot of people consequently would die. Death would be a very uh, normal part of life in these cities and people would see it a lot. But it would give them an evolutionary advantage compared to those who are living unconsolidated out there in their smaller communities. Because exposure to germs and disease and viruses and parasites would propel uh, basically the descendants of those living in cities to develop a higher, uh, a better immune system and a better, better defense mechanisms against these things. This is why we see, for example, throughout uh, the history of colonialism and imperialism, how those who have lived and developed uh, in cities, when they visit tribes out there in nature or other peoples, end up killing a lot of those peoples and tribes because their bodies can't stand up to the diseases and the germs that the city folk have become accustomed to and uh, accustomed to. Let's just say that. Thus, evolutionarily, those dwelling in cities eventually would come to have an advantage uh, in terms of immunology. Fast forwarding a little bit, up to 1600, as humans began to continue to spread out over the globe and meet other communities, and there would be a lot of movement and a lot of resource cultivation and technological advancement, what we see are the foundations of a global economic order and trade and investment and mass production forming. And obviously, once you have that, once you have people's trading with others, resources coming in, wealth coming in, technology advancing, our understanding of the world advancing through exploration, this would also cause a huge population boom, which in turn would come to accelerate human social and technological development. And so Massey has a good quote on this. The human population entered an era of sustained exponential growth that accelerated until the dawn of the 19th century, when the world's population stood at around 954 million. In the 500 generations preceding 1800, the proportion of people living in urban areas never exceeded 5%. And before that year, only 65 cities in the entire history of the world had ever achieved populations greater than 100,000. The vast majority of people in the civilized agrarian societies of the past were illiterate peasants who lived in small villages in isolated hamlets, not much bigger than the hunting and gathering communities of the Paleolithic era. Work was governed by the rhythms of the seasons, and most people lived and died within a few kilometers of where they were born, spending all their lives within a community of friends and relatives they knew personally. In such a society, Culture remains substantially mythic. The only real difference compared with the mythic cultures of hunter-gatherers was the patina of formal structure imposed from above by a priestly class. So, what we see him talking about here is the frequency and the growth and the limitations of cities prior to 1800 
what life was like basically for people who lived in these rural areas and how order was imposed and what society was like. It was still mythic, right? These people would have various narratives and stories about the origins of humanity and their place in the world and how they ought to live. Norms and values would probably be formulated and enforced by a priestly class of individuals who were seen as sages or intellectuals or religious men of their time who would engage in the necessary religious rituals to keep the society going, uh, would tell others how they are to live, when they are supposed to worship, etc. We can compare and contrast such a class of people, the priestly class, with the warrior class, with the working class that would engage in you know, the production and the cultivation of resources, and perhaps historically what we might call a merchant class, those that would handle trade and money. Thus, we might say that in agrarian societies, holy people, religious people, brought a certain order to society but something even more important is going on during this time. What we see is the emergence of written language. And what our best guess is why this happened is it became necessary to develop a way to write things down to track trade and the stock of goods and economic transactions. So in the past, people would write those kinds of things down on clay tablets and stone tablets and in other places to record that important information that they would need for trade and production in the buying and selling of goods. The emergence of written language, it's hard to overstate, has been incredibly important in the development of human society and technology. Being able to write things down has opened so many doors for us. It's hard to mention or discuss them all. For starters, doing this would reduce demand on biological memory. If we can write things down, we don't have to keep all that stuff up here. We don't have to remember all of it, which frees up cognitive space and mental energy to engage in other tasks, whether that's thinking about the world, planning, developing a military strategy, etc., developing new technology. The written language would allow us to preserve records of our own history, of events, of economic transactions, of our understanding of the world, and all that stuff. It would allow us to preserve information, which would be incredibly important and useful. And through the development of various alphabets and languages and the written word, it would give us a new way to explore and understand the world around us as well. Each language is arguably a lens that you could use to view reality through. And so with the development of the written language would come the development of more complex concepts, deeper understandings of the world around us, and again, the aforementioned prose as well, being able to record information, preserve records, all that stuff. And humans kind of trucked along for a while, farming in these agrarian societies, having domesticated animals and various plants. And there would be, in certain parts of the world, a steady intellectual and technological advancement. But in recent history, not only has population exploded, but what we see is an explosion in knowledge and thought, intellectual life, and technology. That's what we're going to be looking at in the next lecture. So, I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found it useful. Again, what I'm trying to provide for you here is just a very brief overview and oversimplification about how human 
environment such as society and culture has impacted us as well as how the natural environment uh, and its interplay with human evolution has caused us to develop certain bodies, certain physiological and cognitive mechanisms. All of this stuff is important and has had such a profound effect, not only on the technologies that we developed, but where we have settled down, the kind of cultures, laws, norms, and traditions that we have, and the kinds of understandings of the world that we have today. Okay, thank you very much. I will see you next time for our wrap-up and concluding thoughts on this piece. Have a good one.